Hi, everybody. Welcome, and I'm very pleased that you could join us this evening for our DOAS public program. I have a few announcements that I'd like to mention before I introduce our speakers this evening. Uh, a DOAS Youth Outreach Environmental Education Internship is available. It's a 10-week program, which includes a rigorous training program, three four-day camp sessions, and a series of family programs. Please visit the website for a thorough description. The Great Backyard Bird Count is underway. Enjoy counting birds through the, night, through the 19th this weekend and submit your sightings at birdcount.org. Upcoming programs include Wolf Spiders on March 15th, Rick Bunting's Photos and Natural History on April 19th, and Bringing the Endangered American Burying Beetle Back to New York on May 17th. The Otsego County Conservation Association's Earth Fest is on Saturday, April 20th at Milford Central School, including an early bird walk and special presentations during the event. I'd like, before I introduce our speaker this evening, I'd like to mention to all of you, if you have questions for Jeff, please use the, key, the Q and A, not the chat. We'll be monitoring the Q and A to relate your questions. Our presenter this evening is Jeff O'Handley. Jeff O'Handley is the program director for the Otsego County Conservation Association, where he is frequently found butt deep in a swamp or freezing in the forest and loving it. A lifelong interest in science and nature led Jeff to study wildlife management at Cook College, Rutgers University, but he soon found great enjoyment in environmental education. Jeff's career has taken him from tiny museums and expansive state parks to the heart of New York City. Jeff and his wife, Susan O'Handley, moved to Hartwick in 2003 and formed Wildlife Learning Company, which provided environmental education programs throughout the region. Jeff joined OCCA in 2013. Tonight, he will teach us about invasive species. Welcome, Jeff. Thank you so much, Becky, and thank you everybody for, for having me. Um, it's a pleasure. I've been a longtime member of DOAS, and so it's nice to be on sort of the other side of the presentation today. Um, and now I, I can get rid of one of my slides, basically, from that nice introduction. So um, again, invasive species, what to watch for, what to do, and uh, we're in, in this program will go through a little bit of background on invasive species and what sort of impacts they have, what makes something an invasive species. And then we'll go into a little more detail about uh, some target species in the area, um, some that are here already, some that are maybe not so much, and kind of what's what's going on with them. Uh, let me make sure that's working. Okay, so first off, I have to, to get this one out of the way. What is the Otsego County Conservation Association? Uh, we are a private nonprofit environmental organization that was founded in 1968, so we've been around for a while. And um, initially, it was people who were concerned about, I think, sustainable forestry based on the history. And uh, we've uh, broadened out into a number of different areas. Um, just uh, our, our current uh, program categories include conservation, which includes our invasive species work. We do outreach and events, and Becky mentioned Earth Festival coming up on April 20th at Milford Central School. That's always a big one. Uh, we've been involved with recycling and solid waste um, in the county for quite some time, and our drive through drop-off recycling event will be coming up the week after Earth Festival on the 27th. We are also co-sponsoring the Otsego Film Plastic School Recycling Challenge, uh, that's going on in schools now uh, through early April with the Solid Waste Department. Um, and then education is part of everything we do, uh, whether it's running into a boater out there while we're pulling water chestnuts in Goodyear Lake and having a casual conversation or more formal programs. Uh, we've been doing watershed education with teachers the last couple of years. We do nature walks. We do uh, family programs, homeschool programs, et cetera. So we, we, we cover a lot of ground. Um, 
and then this is me. Um, Becky covered covered pretty much everything there is to know. I guess this is part of my natural habitat um, in summer, doing a, a water chestnut pull over in New Berlin. Um, one of the things that I do like about being an educator is that I always have to learn. And I knew a little bit about uh, invasive species when I started at OCCA, but have certainly learned quite a bit. Um, one of the other things that's changed in, in the 10 years that I've been with OCCA is that when I started, uh, our invasive species programs were really uh, a summer thing. We go out and do water chestnut poles at a couple of different places. Um, but now it's pretty much year round. Um, as I said, freezing in the forest. I think this was last week. Um, Sorry to scare you there uh, with that. Um, and, you know, while I've learned a lot more about invasive species in the last 10 years, I realized that it was actually something I've been interested in and familiar with ever since I was a kid, uh, when I used to spend far too many Saturday mornings in front of the TV watching these old 50s uh, monster movies, um, invasive species, right? Uh, you know, and, and usually those sort of invasive species were of two types. There were the kind that came from outer space that were trying to eat us or enslave us. And then there were the kind that were here all along, but, you know, science gone awry kind of uh, makes them larger and wanting to eat us and or enslave us. Um, but the reality of invasive species is very different. It's far less uh, spectacular size wise and generally far less bloodthirsty. So we hope um, this is a spongy moth known to many uh, previously as the gypsy moth, the name the name has changed on that. Um, you know, they're, they're not things that are coming to enslave us or eat us. They're, they're here and they're just trying to, to make their own living basically. Um, now let's, uh, we'll define invasive species first to make sure that we're all on the same page about this. If you ask people, what, what do invasive species mean? You get different words that come out usually that involve uh, overpopulation, uh, taking over, uh, out competing, and those are all part of it. Uh, New York State uses a specific definition uh, that invasive species are plants or animals that are not native to the environment in question, and they cause or are likely to cause harm to the environment, the economy, and human health. Okay. Now, I have a checkbox up here to be considered an invasive species. The organism has to be non-native. That's the current with the current definition. So if it checks that first box, it could be invasive, right? And then it only has to check off any one of these boxes, environment, economy, or human health, in order to be considered invasive. Some species check off all three, some check off one, different ones, et cetera. Okay? And no, there's our familiar uh, European starlet there. So, so what do we mean by some of these different things? Like what does harm to the environment mean? Well, if you remember that little spongy moth that's uh, showing up down there in the lower right, um, this is an example of damage to the environment caused by the caterpillars of the spongy moth. Okay, um, This is out in Wisconsin, all of these sort of grayish brown trees all around here have been uh, defoliated by the feeding of the spongy moth caterpillar. So what kinds of impact can that have on the forest? Well, um, without the canopy, you're allowing a lot more light to penetrate to the forest floor. Uh, this can lead to increased temperatures on the forest floor, drier conditions, um, and this will impact the soil, uh, the soil flora and fauna. And this can impact things like nutrient cycling, seedling regeneration, and it potentially opens up the forest floor to um, exploitation by other invasive species that, that maybe need a little bit more light to grow. If this happens over multiple years, you'll have lots of dead trees and a changing composition of the forest. Um, in addition, without that leaf canopy, um, rainfall, which would normally be intercepted and slowed down by those leaves, is going to hit the ground with a lot more velocity and over a much shorter duration. This can um, lead to runoff and erosion, and we know that erosion ends up going somewhere else. Right, so you're carrying away soil, you're carrying away nutrients, and where is it going? It might be going into this lake. It wouldn't surprise me if all of the green stuff over here, the uh, algae, algae blooms, are, are the result of excess nutrients running off. Okay. Um, and in addition, for things like our, our forest-dwelling birds, 
without that canopy there, there's um, the potential for um, greater mortality of nestlings due to heat stress, as well as increased predation from, uh, from things that can now see them and find them. When we talk about harm to the economy, um, we're talking about some potentially huge impacts. Uh, the street scenes here are from Worcester, Massachusetts, and uh, is the, the Worcester's reaction to an infestation of Asian longhorned beetles. I was working in New York City for the Central Park Conservancy in 1996 when Asian longhorned beetles first turned up there. This is a beetle that um, the larva will tunnel through tree limbs and can kill the tree and can have tree limbs falling down. The Parks Department uh, response to this, <clears throat> excuse me, was if they found a tree that had Asian longhorn beetle in it, they would cut it down to the ground and chip it into about half inch pieces. And any tree that touched that tree would also be taken down. This is to prevent the spread of that beetle. Uh, 23 years after it was discovered in New York City, uh, the Parks Department declared the Asian longhorned beetle eradicated in the city, but it cost the city about $2 billion. Um, and in McCarran Park in Brooklyn, right down the block from where my mother grew up, actually, um, every single tree in that park was replaced, so at, at huge cost. So in this case here in Worcester, you're looking at a municipality that is paying um, to remove these trees in an effort to control the beetle. And then the homeowners in turn are, are likely to see increased heating and cooling costs without these street trees and reduced property values. Okay. Um, globally, invasives are estimated to cost about $423 billion a year. That includes the costs of control, the costs of restoration, um, uh, uh, early detection projects, um, and also lost revenue. Uh, U.S. agriculture loses an estimated $13 billion in crop yields every year to agricultural pests, invasive agricultural pests. So it's pretty significant. It's money that, you know, it would be nice to be able to spend on other things. And then in terms of human health, you know, I get yelled at for showing this slide. This is my leg after exposure to um, wild parsnip. This is actually not bad. It looks worse than it felt, but plants like parsnip or giant hogweed can cause severe skin burns uh, that could lead to hospitalization or uh, the need for skin grafts, uh, for example. I think I've heard of people who got hogweed in the eye that, that had uh, blindness, right? Uh, so pretty severe. Uh, over on the right is the Asian tiger mosquito, which is one of the worst um, invasive species going, um, highly invasive insect that, that has been brought to many different environments. Um, the uh, tiger mosquito can transmit uh, the virus that leads to uh, dengue, yellow fever, West Nile virus, and other forms of encephalitis. Okay. Um, and then not pictured here would be that, you know, when we go back to Asian longhorn beetle and such that uh, uh, trees, for example, that that are have, are died, dead from uh, some of the invasives, those limbs can fall down. People have been killed by falling limbs as a result of invasives. So let's get that off of there for now. Okay. Now, I do have a couple of caveats that I want to that I want to bring out um, uh, as we go first. And uh one is that no species is inherently bad. Um, when we used to do our wildlife learning company program, sometimes if we had a hawk, kids would hear that this hawk ate squirrels or rabbits and they'd say, oh, he's mean or oh, he's bad. But no, he's not bad, that's just what they do. In the case of invasives, such as this mile a minute weed that uh, uh, this was down in Davenport, I believe. Um, it's a, it's a <clears throat> excuse me, it's an organism that has been brought typically by people to a location that it's not supposed to be in, right? Um, most organisms that become invasive have high reproductive rates or uh, in many cases are able to live in a wide variety of environments. They find themselves in a place that gives them the things they need and doesn't have some of the restrictions that they would find in their home location, such as predators or parasites. <clears throat> Excuse me. So they're not waking up in the morning and thinking, ha ha, how can I mess with people today? They're, they're just doing what they do. They're not inherently bad. The second thing is that language matters. The language surrounding invasive species is very violent. We talk about war. We talk about battle. We talk about infestations and extermination and eradication. 
Um, this can sometimes lead to um, uh, unexpected impacts. I, I'd heard about somebody who thought they'd seen an emerald ash borer and they killed it and they, they told me about it. And I realized after talking to them that what they killed was a green tiger beetle, which is a native and probably would be considered good species, right? Um, we don't want to see unnecessary cruelty when it comes to dealing with um, these organisms, such as feral hogs, right, which are definitely a problem in some areas. And um, I think that as we'd seen with um, COVID, where there was a bit of a backlash against Asian people because of the origins of COVID, we don't want to see that happen. Um, so there are people who are looking at how can we soften this language a little bit, right? Get the point across, but not make it quite so violent and perhaps not, uh, you know, blame. Uh, I mentioned the, uh, the spongy moth before, which had been known as the gypsy moth. That's a name changed as, as part of, you know, kind of thinking about words and language and how that impacts, uh, you know, the, the potential impacts of that. And finally, I'll mention that climate change is going to change more than climate. Um, it's going to change, I think, what is considered invasive and when. Um, we're already seeing, you know, plant hardiness zones change. We're seeing certainly uh, species of birds moving further north or um, higher in uh, uh, altitudes to, um, you know, to, to deal with the change in climate. We are expecting, you know, that northward shift and also an east. Uh, uh, for some of the species, they're looking at potential eastward shifts. What will be considered invasive um, going forward, right? Um, what will we have to get used to? And the other possibility, the other thing is that there are a number of species, alien species that are considered that are not invasive, that are living here among us in small numbers that are not damaging the economy, the environment, or human health. But as climate changes, it may change the conditions for them. And, and you know, these so-called sleeper species may become a problem further down the line. So that's something to think about. So now we're going to move into some different species that uh, we've been dealing with at OCCA or that we have to have to look forward to uh, in some cases, potentially. Uh, the first one is uh, one that we're very involved with right now, and that is the hemlock woolly adelgid, which probably you've heard of. I hope you've heard of it, um, whether you, you know, depending on what you know about it. This is an insect. Um, it's a, like an aphid-like type of insect. We note six legs here. And this big, long, curly thing here is actually its mouth part. Um, the uh, hemlock woolly adelgid, this is not something you're ever going to see like this. This creature is about 0.2 milliliters long at this stage of its life, so barely visible with the naked eye. The full-grown adult hemlock woolly adelgid is about one and a half millimeters long. So how do we know where it is? How do we know what to look for? Okay. Um, this is native to Japan and the Pacific Northwest. Um, interestingly enough, there are hemlock species out in both locations. Um, on the East Coast, we know uh, from genetic studies that the adelgid came over from Japan. It was first de detected in Richmond, Virginia in 1951. It's believed to have come over on nursery stock that was imported from Japan, so ornamental hemlocks. This is a great way that invasive species travel, right? We we bring plants over from one place to another because they look nice or because they're food, and sometimes they have hitchhikers on them. Okay. Uh, it's a slow mover, which is one of the good things. It did not arrive in New York until the middle 1980s, and it didn't really start arriving in the Delaware Otsego Audubon Society region until late 90s or early 2000s even. So I mentioned, you know, what do we, we're looking at an insect that is, uh, you know, 0.2 milliliters to one and a half millile millimeters, not milliliters, excuse me. Um, what are we looking for? Okay. Um, just the background is, if you remember that long tube-like mouth part, um, the adelgid will crawl around for a brief part of its life, and then it inserts its mouth into the twig and begins to feed. And once it attaches itself, it doesn't move again for the rest of its life. It stays put. So what we're looking for is, um, oh, sorry, the backtrack here. Um, part of what makes this so good at exploiting our environment is that it has an unusual life cycle that includes two generations per year. Um, there's one that is actively feeding and growing now. They will lay eggs in late winter, 
Those eggs will hatch into a second generation that will feed and go complete its life cycle by the middle of summer and then have eggs out for the next generation that will feed throughout the winter. So what do you look for? You look for the wool. And hopefully, maybe some of you can see where the wool is on this twig. There's an arrow right here is this little fuzzy ball, right? And here's another one. Here's another one. This is a light infestation of adelgid on a tree up near Cooperstown. And this is a heavier infestation. You can see um, all each of these little fuzzy balls. The adelgid produces this wool from glands on its body. Uh, once it starts feeding in the in the the fall, it will produce this this oversac, it's called. Uh, it's about maybe three sixteenths of an inch across. And each of these little woolly masses has an adelgid in it. So if you count them up, you could tell exactly how many uh, hemlock woolly adelgids are on here. Uh, but we're not going to do that. Um, now, eventually, uh, towards the end of the winter, these uh, little woolly sacks will also contain eggs. And uh, each a female adelgid winter generation can lay up to about 200 eggs. The second generation that, that produces in spring and early summer, I think generally lays fewer eggs, but we don't know how many exactly. So it's very possible for the adelgid to very quickly overpopulate on a hemlock tree or crawl off to an, another. There's a brief stage where they do crawl. Okay? Um, this is the adelgid with the wool removed. This is full size. These little orangey, reddish brown blobs here and there are the actual eggs. Okay. So what are some of the impacts of the adelgid? When the adelgid's feeding, um, as, it, as it's uh, drawn forth uh, plant juices and sugars from the, the tree, it form, the, the tree forms scar tissue. One adelgid may not be a problem. 50 adelgids on a twig is a, is a big problem that formation of scar tissue will start to impede the flow of water and nutrients through the twig, and that leads to dieback, needle loss. Typically, the needles don't turn brown as much, but they, they'll take on a grayish green cast, and then they'll eventually fall off. Um, if you're familiar with hemlock trees, you know that it should not look like this on the left. Hemlocks typically have very dense, um, uh, heavy foliage, that prevents a lot of light from passing through. If you're looking at hemlocks and you're seeing lots of light through them, consider that there's a possibility that it may have hemlock woolly adelgid. Also, if you see it start to turn kind of gray. Long term, um, in as little as four to 10 years, an infestation of adelgids can kill a previously healthy hemlock tree. This is a scene from the Appalachians, the Southern Appalachians where um, they've been dealing with this for you know, 60, 70 years. In New York, hemlock is the fifth most common tree in our forests, and that is down. It was third or fourth, I think, the last time they did some censuses, and presumably falling in part due to the adelgid. Okay. Um, and certainly, those, if we're from the Cooperstown area, you look at the east side of Otsego Lake, and you see that that whole eastern side is, is full of hemlocks. If you travel up and down various county roads and along uh, stream valleys, hemlocks love those kinds of environments. Um, it's a very important tree considered to be a foundation species that basically makes its own environment and supports many um, birds, uh, wildlife, micro, macro and micro invertebrates um, and small terrestrial vertebrates as well. It's an important tree for maintaining uh, water quality and uh, uh, trout populations as well. And it's a beautiful tree. Um, you know, really, it really it, um, creates very unique environments um, that, that are just lovely to be in as well. Uh, this is out in Morris. We were out here last week in, in Morris, and this is just, there's an old growth hemlock stand out there. Uh, lots of moss, lots of moisture, just really uh, an amazing place to be. And fortunately, we didn't find any adelgid there. Uh, where is it now? Um, in New York State, uh, these green dots represent confirmed infestations of hemlock woolly adelgid. We, get, we can see that uh, the Catskill region has been heavily hit. It worked its way up through Pennsylvania into the southern tier. 
It's worked its way up into the southern Adirondacks and around Lake George and out on Long Island, etc. In northern Delaware and in Otsego, we don't see quite as much right now. We see several blobs of it around Otsego Lake and down in the Oneonta area. Part of this is because for a long time, people weren't really looking. Um, and one of the things that we are doing at OCCA uh, this winter in particular, and the last couple of winters, is we are getting people out in the field. We're doing education programs about Adelgid, and we are getting volunteers and staff out to look for hemlock woolly Adelgid. Uh, one of the other good things about it is that it is treatable. Um, in a home environment, uh, there are different uh, insecticides that work very effectively on treating the adelgid itself and helping the hemlocks get back to health. Uh, there's also a group out at Cornell, the New York State Hemlock Initiative, that is doing a lot of work looking at biological controls, and those are um, uh, very promising. So part of what we're doing is getting out there trying to find out where the adelgid is and how bad it is, and that will allow potential research sites for the biological controls, and it will give uh, land managers and homeowners uh, options on what they can do about that. So we're going to move on to another species, and this one is, well, we're probably going to get it in some way. The spotted lanternfly has been in the news a lot over the last few years. Um, this is another insect, and I realized, by the way, I, I kind of skewed this presentation quite accidentally, a little heavy on the terrestrials, so um, forgive me. Uh, this is another species that is native to Asia, to China, Korea, uh, that sort of Eastern Asian uh, area, and if you wonder why so many species seem to come from that area, it's because the climate is very similar. Right? The climate in, in Eastern China, the Korean Peninsula, and parts of Japan is very similar to that um that we experience here and there are similar types of plants for some of these insects to to feed on as well so this one is native to asia it's believed to have well it was first discovered in pennsylvania i forget the year um believed to have arrived on shipments of stone the uh it lays its eggs on stone and uh that's how it got over here um, whereas the hemlock woolly adelgid is a specialist that feeds exclusively on hemlocks the lanternfly is a generalist. It feeds on over 70 types of plant species, including a number of um, agricultural uh, products, grapes, hops, um, apples, cherries, um, and as well as uh, some forest uh, species. Uh, it promotes the growth of sooty mold, which we'll get to in a little bit. And this one has big impact on quality of life. It's not a biter, which is good. It doesn't, doesn't hurt people directly. Uh, but it but uh, it does damage the economy and it certainly impacts our our quality of life. Okay. So the insect itself is a like a plant hopper or leaf hopper. Its total length is about one inch long as an adult, and it has it's 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 an interesting looking critter, right? It's got these very dark black spots on its forewings. The last third of the wings has this sort of black. I, I almost think of it as a brickwork type of pattern here. And if it opens its wings, if you get to see it open its wings and they can fly, the hind wings have this bright red, again with spots, and the abdomen has some yellow, uh, yellow bands on the, on the sides and a little bit of striping across the insect, uh, across the middle. It's an interesting looking insect, um, might be even considered kind of pretty uh, if, you, if you, in certain contexts. Okay. So we're going to take a look at the life cycle and see part of why this is such a, uh, difficult insect to find in some ways. I mentioned that it likes to lay its eggs on just about any surface. So it could be a tree like this, or it could be on a rock. It could be on your car. Uh, they like rusted metal, apparently, very much so for some reason that nobody knows. The eggs themselves are these little, you can probably see them here, these little dark capsules of the individual eggs. So they typically will lay three or four or five strings of eggs side by side. And then they cover it over with this putty-like compound. And it looks like somebody just did a bad spackling job on the side of this tree. There's at least four egg masses here. There's one here, one here, and then these are probably fresher. There's one here and then another one down here. And again, on this rock, there's, you know, five at least for sure. 
Okay. Um, so the uh, adults will lay these eggs in late anywhere from fall to early winter. They will be active until the first hard frost, the eggs over winter, and they'll hatch out in April or May into these tiny little insects. These are about a quarter of an inch long. Okay. Uh, they are black with numerous white spots on the back and on the legs. They look a little bit like ticks, uh, but they are not ticks. Okay. Um, and this behavior that we see here uh, is pretty typical. They do tend to congregate, and that is part of their problem. That is part of what, what the issue with them. Now, the uh, lanternfly feeds, similarly to the uh, hemlock woolly adelgid, it uses a piercing, sucking mouth part to penetrate through the bark of a tree or the host plant and suck out juices, but it's mobile. It keeps moving around. Uh, the young will develop and go through three stages of life where they look pretty much the same all the way through. And then their final stage before adulthood, they turn this um, red and black, right? So red and black with white spots. Okay? Um, and at this point, they're probably about a half to three quarters of an inch long. Okay? And here we see the last stage of the nymph and an earlier stage of the nymph side by side. And these will coexist okay, at different, you know, you'll see multiple stages of development at the same time. And then finally, in middle to late summer, these uh, last late stage nymphs will transition to adults. Okay? And uh, now they're again about an inch long with that full familiar pattern. They don't go through any chrysalis stage or any pupal stage, they'll just shed their old skin and and out they pop, okay? And, you know, I, I showed those monster movie posters before, and this one is kind of the horror story. Um, spotted lanternflies like to feed en masse. And so they'll gather up in hundreds or thousands of lanternflies uh, on trees and, uh, you know, and, and just make life miserable, right? So in addition to the damage they can do to uh, the host plants, you don't want to live in this kind of setting. This is a typical, you know, Pennsylvania setting uh, where lanternfly is heavy. Okay. So their feeding behavior over here on the left, we see these streaks of fluid. When there are many lanternflies, they're, they're puncturing through the bark and, and feeding. This can lead to weeping of, of the sap when they move on. Um, when there are enough lanternflies feeding, it can weaken the, uh, the host plant. The uh, puncture wounds can also lead to secondary infections from bacteria or, or other pathogens. Okay? Now, the other side effect that we didn't mention is that lantern flies have a liquid diet, and liquid diet means that their poop is also liquid. And they're feeding actually on the starches that are in the saps and in the plant juices, and what they're excreting is called honeydew, which is liquid that is very, very concentrated in sugars. So, uh, Drops of this liquid will just drip out of the back end of uh, a spotted lanternfly and land on whatever's underneath it. It might be the uh, other parts of the plant. It's very sticky um, and unpleasant. And I mentioned earlier that it promotes the growth of sooty mold. That's what all the, the black stuff is on these leaves here. Um, and that can actually impinge on the plant's ability to photosynthesize, which would further weaken it when this stuff gets really uh, going. Not very pleasant at all. Um, the lanternfly turned up first in southeastern Pennsylvania. It is spread across a fair chunk of the northeast. <clears throat> U.S. Department of Agriculture has quarantine zones across much of Pennsylvania. If you do any visiting of relatives in Pennsylvania in um, uh, lanternfly season, you probably want to run your car through a car wash before leaving the state, um, which can hopefully, you know, they're, they're very good hitchhikers. And again, if it's an egg laying season, you, you know, you want to wash those things off. Uh, I'm not quite sure where the infestation has been found in Delaware County. Uh, right now, I believe it's still fairly light in the Hudson, but they've certainly had problems with it down in New York City and parts of Long Island. Otsego County, we had one sighting, which was basically a dead one stuck to a, a car grill at a, an inspection station. <clears throat> and what are we doing? We're starting to ramp up our education programs. We'll be doing more with that this, um, this summer. And uh, last year, we had a demonstration project. Here's Nick, the intern. 
um, who uh, is here at a spotted lantern fly trap that we put up in Cooperstown. This was more about education. We didn't expect to find anything. Uh, the lantern flies often fall out of the tree. They crawl back up the tree, get stuck in the screen, and end up in the bag, and then we can tell if they are there or not. Um, this coming year, we expect to be setting out traps in a number of locations at New York Department of Agriculture and Markets, uh, which kind of heads up the Spotted Lanternfly Initiative in New York. I think we'll be also doing some work out here. So on Spotted Lanternfly, if you find one or you think you find one, what do you do? Um, you want to photograph the insect, egg masses, or the signs of an infestation. We always tell people to include, include a ruler or object for scale, such as your hand. That will work. The lanternfly is not a biter. Right? Um, ideally, if you can, if, if you kill the insect and it's not too mangled or you catch it alive, you can freeze it in a Ziploc bag. Um, folks might want you to send it to them, but this way you can get a good picture of it. You're going to note the location. Where did you find it? Right? Um, GPS coordinates are best, ultimately, if you can get them, but even intersections or street addresses. And then we send this to spottedlanternfly at agriculture.ny.gov. They also have on the Department of Agriculture and Markets uh, webpage, they have a form for you to uh, report this for, report it to, excuse me. And this will be recorded, so I guess uh, you can always check it out later. Oh, there's only two T's in spotted lantern fly. I can't believe I missed that. All right. So I'm going to move kind of quickly through this one. And I include this here because um, this is very closely um, associated with the spotted lantern fly. And for Otsego County, it may be a saving grace because in 20 years, I have never seen one in Otsego County. And so I'm, I'm hopeful. So this tree of heaven is native to Eastern Asia, China, the same general area that the spotted lantern fly is found in. It was imported, introduced as late in the late 1700s, a really early uh, importation as an ornamental tree. People liked the way it looked. It's got this kind of tropical sort of look to it, I suppose. Um, but it is extremely, extremely invasive. Um, if you live in an urban area, if you live in New York City or Queens or something, you see this tree everywhere. And it has a habit of waging chemical warfare on its neighbors. It will produce compounds that go out into the soil that suppress the growth of other, um, other species, uh, uh, competitors. Okay. And it's the tree that grows in Brooklyn from that famous book from many, many years ago, The Tree of Heaven or Ilanthus. Okay. Uh, not a great picture, but again, this is a... Uh, the young tree of heaven will have a very straight single uh, trunk that will then start to spread as it gets taller. It has a long pinnately compound leaf. It's about two feet long with multiple leaflets on the side. It'll look superficially like sumacs, which I think many of us are familiar with along the roadsides. The bark has this unique look, almost like a cantaloupe sort of look, cantaloupe rind. And it is a prolific seeder in middle of summer. Uh, it has a single seed in a papery wing, like a maple seed, but it's the, the, the seed is in the center. The wing is kind of twisted. Um, and this allows it to disperse pretty far from the, uh, from the parent plant. Okay. Um, on this left shot, this is a sumac leaf up here. This is a tree of heaven leaf here. Tree of heaven leaves are bigger. Um, maybe slightly reddish. And one of the distinguishing fa ca characters of Tree of Heaven is if you crush up the leaf, it's going to smell like rancid peanut butter, they say. Up close, the sumac leaf has tiny serrations along the leaf margin, whereas our Ilanthus has a smooth margin. And then at the base of the Ilanthus, it has these, these sort of rounded, like two or three rounded teeth on the bottom. Okay. Uh, at the very base of the leaf. So it does, it'll look a little similar to things like walnuts or um, uh, the sumacs, but crush up the leaf if you think it, and if it smells really bad, it's it's going to be our ailanthus. Okay. So I mentioned th this is kind of a tough map to read. The hexagons represent locations where ailanthus has been seen. The size of the orange dot represents the numbers of locations. So everywhere, all of the urban, major urban areas have Tree of Heaven, you get down here. And then our more rural areas, it's far less frequent. It doesn't really like forest environments very well, but it does well with, with um, disturbed sites. 
So we have to watch out for it, particularly along highways and railroad lines and anywhere there's new construction. Right, now I'm going to move on to an aquatic. I, I, um, this is a new one for us, yellow floating heart. Um, this, uh, we were, uh, uh, I guess, tipped off about this by uh, folks at the Catskill Regional Invasive Species Partnership that run out of uh, run out of the Arkville area and work in our region. They said we found this we found this plant down in South Worcester. Maybe you want to help us out with uh, with getting rid of it. And we said, like suckers, we said sure. Um, this is a uh, rooted aquatic plant, so it, it will put roots down in the pond or lake where it's growing. Uh, it will then extend out rhizomes or sort of horizontal stems to the side. Every few inches or so, it produces a node with multiple leaves that float on the surface. It's native to Eurasia, so fairly wide range across that sort of, uh, you know, from, I guess, far Eastern Europe across uh, much of Asia. And if you look at it closely, the leaves are sort of like a water lily. They're smaller than a water lily, typically maybe four inches or so maximum size, and they have a sort of a wavy edge to them. Okay. This is a plant that can impede boating, swimming, and fishing once it gets established, and it really slows down the water, causes stagnation, uh, improves habitat for mosquitoes, which we usually don't want, um, and uh, it can also decrease the oxygen levels in the pond. It typically likes still water environments, but can get established in slow flowing streams. This is just a, a more of a close up on the leaf. I always think of that the leaf reminds me a little bit of how I used to uh, cut circles when I was in kindergarten with scissors, right? You, you could never get a smooth round edge, right? So it's got that sort of wavy, imperfect circle um, or slightly oblong. Uh, it flowers throughout the summer. So it'll flower pretty much from June right through into September. The flower is has five petals and uh, uh, is yellow like the name right sometimes it, it actually makes sense and you know it's a it's a it's an attractive little plant this was presumably brought in as uh, an ornamental because it looks nice right these nice yellow flowers that are blooming all through summer mm -hmm. uh what about now okay how do you like that now um it it, it can very quickly take over um ponds and uh just just dominate completely once it's the flowering is done, it will produce these capsules that have little seeds in them that remind me of uh, Smarties, the little candy Smarties. They're small discs, um, and those discs can float and get carried away by water. Uh, they can also hook onto the feathers of waterfowl and be uh, transported from one place to another. And the plant also is very good at um, at uh, transporting by fragmentation. Okay. Uh, next year, I'm going to take one of these pictures myself and not have to rely on uh, people in Michigan. Um, those rhizomes form these dense mats that make it almost impossible to get through. Um, and, you know, you just got to work pulling it up. This is Nick, again, doing the dirty job, hauling out a kayak full from this pond in South Worcester where we worked. Okay. Uh, this is that pond. It was about five acres in size. Pretty much everything you see on the surface that's not sticking up like these sort of grassy plant uh, things is yellow floating heart. It covered about 85% of this pond surface. And when we were done with it, we probably got about a third of it cleared. So we'll be back in there next year. Um, I am this is very hard work. It's kind of backbreaking work, leaning over and pulling stuff up and, and slogging through the muck. Um, but we actually did manage to have a lot of fun as well, and we didn't lose anybody. So we're expecting to get back out there with the folks from CRISP this coming year, and uh, hopefully we'll, we'll be able to knock it all out. Where is it located in our area? Not too common. I think there's more populations out in Western New York in our region, just outside of Otsego County, this is where we were working, and then a site down in the Catskills and a few scattered up here. This is a high priority invasive species for our region. If you see it, let us know. That's that's the, uh, the takeaway there. I realize I'm, I'm running short on time, right? I'm, I'm just gonna go through. Uh, we're gonna move on to another terrestrial, <clears throat> excuse me, 
called the uh, swallowworts. This is actually two species, um, the pale swallowwort and the black swallowwort. I don't know that I'm saying that right. Uh, these are also sometimes known as dog strangling vines. It's a weird name. I'm not quite entirely sure why. The strangling part makes sense because these plants have a tendency to climb over other vegetation and basically strangle it and smother it. These are in the milkweed family, but they are of no help to monarch butterflies. They found that if monarchs lay eggs on these uh, on the swallowworts, the larva cannot survive. Um, and it is a perennial twining vine. So, you know, you can cut it down, but the root, if the root crown is left, um, it will uh, grow back the following year. And it's native to Europe, Western Mediterranean area, Ukraine and Southern Russia is, is where it's from. Um, presumably it was brought over as an ornamental. Uh, photos on the left are the flowers. I wonder if you can guess which one is the pale swallowwort and which one is the black swallowwort. Right? Um, and on the right, this is a, a small infestation that was found over at Arnold Lake State Forest. You can see sort of the, the way it grows. The leaves have a bit of variation to the shape. They're kind of pointy on the ends, sort of lance shaped, but sometimes also a little more rounded. And there's several uh, of these vines growing through here. Uh, they can grow to be about, they can climb about six to seven feet high. Um, so they can climb up over small shrubs and other vegetation. And uh, some of the impacts that they have is that they will um, reduce diversity. They hold back um, uh, succession and uh, grass, that they can impact grasslands. Over on the right is a bigger infestation than I've ever seen. Um, and again, this is not this would not be good for your grassland birds. If it gets established, it wouldn't be good in um, in uh, a pasture land either. If you're if you're you know grazing cows or or such, okay. um, it produces late in summer these pods that look a little bit like milkweed pods or look a little like beans. I was walking down the street in Cooperstown and I saw somebody had string beans growing in their front yard and I saw the pods and first thought, oh my gosh, it's swallowwort. Then I looked again and said, no, that's that's not. It was uh, some string beans. Uh, each of these pods holds a number of uh, uh, fluffy seeds, like you know your typical milkweed that they'll split open in fall and those seeds will be carried out by wind and can be dispersed um, pretty far. I don't have some, I don't have great shots of that, unfortunately. Uh, so this is an interesting distribution. Again, very heavy in the Hudson Valley. Uh, up around the uh, the great the great uh, Lake Ontario, around Syracuse, not widespread so far. <clears throat> excuse me, not widespread so far in our area. It is definitely something that we are on the lookout for, and uh, so you know we'll try to get the word out about what it looks like and where to look, and then go from there. So I, I, in the short amount of time I have left, I want to go through some of these other things we mentioned for spotted lanternfly. Who you go through. Um, with these other species, if you think you find one, now what do you do? Again, the same thing. You want to take a picture, uh, a good picture. This is hard to do. Um, include the identification. Well, uh, include an object, right? So you can see how long this is. This is a jumping worm, by the way. Um, include the location, uh, again, to help people find it again. For these, I would say that you can send information to me so that we can look at it. I'll have my email again at the end of this. Um, or there's a, a statewide regional database, IMAP Invasives, that allows you to report findings of invasives um, without necessarily using an account, or you can sign up for a free account. It's, it's a really good program, and we use it all the time to help us figure out where things are and uh, what we, you know, where, where we should look. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay. I do have a couple of tips and tricks, do's and don'ts for invasive species. Um, New York has regulations on firewood. You're not supposed to move untreated firewood more than 50 miles from its source. 50 miles is a lot. I would say, you know, if you can avoid taking firewood from your home to camp, do that. You know, you don't want to move it. Lots of forest pests, lots of insects are, are carried around on firewood and moved from place to place. Um, if you're doing work out in nature somewhere or whatever or at your camp or or you know doing trail work even uh clean up everything um afterwards um you know wash it off uh um 
you know, use a boot brush when you're leaving a trail somewhere as well. So you're not uh, potentially bringing seeds with you to another location. Um, if you're planting around your home, use locally sourced native plants whenever possible. Audubon has lots of great uh, information on this on their website. So check that one out. A couple more, never release animals into the wild. And I would include bait. Uh, or worms from fishing. I have seen this myself where people have left containers of red wrigglers on the ground because they were done with them and they, you know, they say, I don't want to kill them, right? But by just releasing them, you're potentially introducing invasive species into the area. Um, when you're out fishing or boating, always clean, drain, and treat your watercraft. This is uh, Kevin, our intern from a couple of years ago, uh, cleaning down one of our canoes after an invasive species work. Um, and do participate in these efforts um, in the area. Okay. Um, some sources that uh, will be available, presumably on the recording, the New York State DEC um, has great information on invasives. Um, the New York Invasive Species Clearinghouse, nyis.info. Um, I didn't mention what PRISMs are. These are regional invasive species management and education groups. We are part of the Catskills Regional Invasive Species Partnership. If you're in the DOAS area, catskillinvasives.com. They are good people. They do great work. Lots of information out there. And I will say, again, get involved. Uh, we are working year-round on invasive species work right now. Um, Hemlock woolly adelgid surveys in the summer. We're doing knotweed removal and uh, water chestnut and stuff. Um, a couple of upcoming dates. We are working every Friday from nine till noonish doing hemlock woolly adelgid surveys um, through the middle of April. Come on out and enjoy the winter weather. Um, in May, we start doing frog bit, which I didn't get to talk about tonight. Um, another aquatic invasive, um, one site in Richfield Springs, another over in Springfield. You can check out our website for our calendar. And I apologize for probably running a little long. There's my email and our website and phone number. And I am open for questions. Thank you very much, everybody. Hi, Jeff. Uh, one of our listeners had the question, suppose, for example, you do find a spotted lanternfly. Should you kill it? You know, I, I mentioned about like not being cruel, et cetera, right. and so forth. And But I would say if you think you've got a spotted lanternfly, yes. Um, if you have to, you kill it, um, you try to collect it, bag it, and, um, you know, again, get a picture and, and uh, let, us, let us know or, or let ag and markets know what, you, what you've got. And is that true for other insects and that sort of thing? I, I hesitate. Um, with spotted lanternfly, I would say yes, just because it is so um, uh, new to the area and not well established. But you know, like if you see a hemlock woolly adelgid on a tree, you know, you're probably, the, the tree probably has more than you can kill safely. Um, so, yeah, <laughs> not a good answer there. I, I apologize. I, I usually try not to just say wholesale, let's kill this thing, you know. Right. Document um, is probably the, the most important thing. Someone else has asked, do you have any advice about jumping worms? I don't, unfortunately. I, I think that um, uh, jumping worms are a real problem uh, in the area. They're, they're getting even more widely established. And I have not heard right now of anything that is effective at controlling them. Um, I know that somebody had told me there was some sort of product that they said, oh, you can, you can pour it in. But but as soon as they said it was like it wasn't listed as a, a a chemical, like it wasn't listed for jumping worms, so they're not allowed to use it technically. And I don't know what it is, unfortunately. Nobody told me what it was. Um, I presume that there's a lot of research that's going on that is trying to figure out how to deal with them. Um, yeah, that's a that's a real tough one. Uh, another person asks if you could. Um... Talk about where to get info on Japanese knotweed. <laughs> oh, Japanese knotweed is uh, uh, such a problem. Um, I, I would go to a site like the, the New York Invasive Species Clearinghouse. 
nyisinfo.com uh, has in information on that. Knotweed is a real problem because you know it's it's so difficult and it's so easy to spread by fragments. We've been working on a small patch up at Mohican Farm in Springfield where our office is located. And what we've basically been doing with it is cutting it down to ground level three times a summer and trying to grub out the roots as much as possible. Um, we put them in heavy duty bags and let them sit and rot in the sun for a few weeks. And we've, you know, we've been doing that project for probably five years now and it's working, but it's a lot of effort. And if you're looking at a wall of knotweed, that is very, very difficult um, to, to contain. Uh, there are certain chemicals that work on it, but, you know, I know the state has done some banning on things like Roundup, and I'm not sure what the most effective is on that right now. Knotweed is really tough, but yeah, I would say go to the New York Invasive Species Clearinghouse and, and take a look at what, what they have to say. Um, quick qu question and a compliment. Thanks, Jeff. Well done. Have you, you checked out the north end of Otsego Lake where all the water lilies are? Any of those invasive, such as yellow floating heart? We, between us and the folks at CRISP, we've been in and out of there a lot. Um, we haven't seen those. Uh, we haven't seen yellow floating heart in there. We've looked for water chestnut in there. We've looked for frog bit in those places, and we haven't found them. Uh, but we'll keep vigilant and and you know for folks who live on the lake and who get out on the lake a lot I'd say you know get in there and and you know paddle around or or boat around and look and and let us know. I have a personal question: is is the yellow floating heart the only yellow water lily? No, okay. there are there are yellow. There's a yellow water lily. The it uh, has a larger leaf generally much larger leaf than our, our yellow floating heart. And the flower, when it comes up, it's that, it looks almost like a golf ball sitting on it, like a yellow golf ball sitting on a tee. Thank you. I, yeah. Okay. Another listener has a couple of comments about jumping worms that you might remark on. He says that dry mustard will make jumping worms come out and they have to be killed. They don't freeze the eggs have to be killed in the fall. Do you know anything about that? I've, I've heard of the mustard. Um, I'm not sure how it works, but I think it's, it. Uh, I, I and I, I thought it was a mustard solution or something that you would pour on the ground and the worms will supposedly come out and then you can just, you can collect them. I haven't tried it myself, but I, I've heard that one works. And yeah, I think that that free yeah freezing may not work with them. That they they may have to be killed some other way, which would probably be bagging and uh, you know leaving in the sun, which is you know kind of horrible. But Jeff, it looks it looks like we don't we don't have any open questions at this point. Okay. I I really appreciate how well versed you are. I mean, we all appreciate how well versed you are in describing these things so that we can all understand them. And I'm very pleased that this is recorded so I can go back and review some of the things that I need to review. <laughs> well, thank you. And I apologize for kind of blazing through the last part of it. It's, uh, you know, <laughs> I always talk too long. You, you, you talk perfectly. Thank oh, you very, very much. We appreciate it. Well, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Take care.